He is a very interesting man. His name is Brendan Somerville and he has a job that I think most of us in this audience tonight would bend over backwards for. He has the title of the Chief Taster for Hague's Chocolate. I mean, how hard would it be getting up to go to work on a Monday morning, hmm? Gee, I've got a bit of Monday-itis. Oh, hang on, I'm going to go to get to work and taste all those assorted creams. I'd be in the car in no time at all. What makes this man really interesting is the fact that uh, he was a public servant for a number of years. He worked, in fact, uh, working with people on the dole, is that right? And then had something of a midlife crisis. Didn't go out and purchase a fast car and get into manscaping. No, instead, he went and studied food technology technology and now has spent the last six years working at Hague's Chocolate. So he's going to be telling us all about what it is that makes chocolate so desirable. Please welcome to the stage Brendan Somerville. Thank you. Um, before you start plotting to uh, knock me off and get my job, I have to let you know that my daughter thinks it's hereditary and when I finish, she's going to just step in and I think she'll be fairly tough competition. Now, chocolate. Lovely stuff. Most people like it. There are, met a few who don't. And they have often ask the question, what is it about chocolate that makes it so attractive? So has anybody got a, an idea what it is about chocolate that makes it so attractive? Smell. 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 Yes. Use violet cream, didn't you, mate? Uh, yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, well, you have exactly. You've got five senses, and it satisfies all of them. And well, so that makes chocolate a food. And well, if you listen to my daughter, it's one of the major food groups. But we won't <laughs> go there yet. So, think about chocolate. It sounds good when you snap it. It looks good when you see it. You know, shiny and glossy, smooth. It smells great. Taste, of course, is well, we just don't question that. And the texture, the fact that it melts at body temperature, it um, cools the mouth and feels so smooth. All great reasons why chocolate isn't, well, you wouldn't be getting gluttonous about chocolate, you'd just be having a fair share. Anyway, a little history of chocolate. Um, some 1500 to 400 years BC, there was a group in the Mexican Gulf area called the Olmecs. <coughs> Not much is known about them nowadays. There was no written language, but from their carvings and bits and pieces of funerary work, they figured out that they were the first people to cultivate cocoa. So that's 1,500 years BC, three and a half thousand years of history. It's not bad for the humble bean. Now, they uh, went the way of many of the uh, South Af American uh, dynasties. They fell. Sometime later, the Mayans came up and they embraced chocolate as well. And it was used in their funeral rites, their religious affairs, their offerings. It was cumed, uh, consumed, rather. It was a sign of wealth. It was uh, drunk as a frothy drink, you know, maize flour and um, beaten up cocoa beans. And then they'd pour it from head height down into jars and do this many, many times to make the drink frothy. That was how it was eaten in, uh, drunk in those days. And they also had the habit of using cocoa beans as currency. Now, in those days, this is you know, before 900 AD, a rabbit was worth 10 cocoa beans. A slave was worth 100. And a woman, the knight, was worth 10. <laughs> so there you go, they were pretty valuable stuff. So when the Spanish came over and, um, well, I call it the conquest, there are other words, I think it's probably better, but um, they came along and they couldn't understand the uh, natives' interest in collecting any beans that had fallen in the bottom of the boats or whatever. They didn't see it for what it really was, the valuable commodity. The Aztecs came along and they drank the old uh, chocolate, again, as a foaming drink, um, thickened with maize flour. They used a tool uh, called a molinilos, molinilos, yes. Um, and it was a sort of uh, club with rings that slide up and down it. So they used to beat it with this to make it frothy. That was their technological advancement. 
Um, that and um, the idea of putting things like chilli, allspice, various local herbs and flavourings and vanilla into their chocolate. So they had this very spicy, savoury chocolate drink. Not as we know it, but then again, it was that um, bean that was given over to the Spaniards as uh, tribute and eventually ended up in Europe. Now, after the Spanish conquest, um, chocolate went over there. It was thought to be the drink of pigs. It was described as swill. It was um, not very well recognised. Eventually, however, it took, and during the Renaissance, um, its use amongst the, well, hyper-rich, I guess, started to uh, increase, and then it grew during the Baroque period. Uh, initially only in the presence of the very wealthy, but its, um, how you say, local favour increased, and it got to the stage, I think it was either in South America or in Spain, that a local bishop got very annoyed at the uh, local ladies for in interrupting the church services to have their, coffee, uh, their chocolate brought in for them to drink during the service because it uh, strengthened them or something. And so he banned the um, use of uh, chocolate during church <coughs> services. Uh, he was faced with a riot, had to recant, and uh, died some months later, evidently from poisoned chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so never underestimate the stuff, what it can do to you. Now, um, throughout Europe, the um, use of chocolate was increasing and they ended up with the chocolate um, rooms, the tea rooms, the coffee rooms, all hotbeds of um, gossip and plotting if you read the, the histories. And then there were what you might call the technological changes that sort of brought chocolate from the, the bitter frothy drink that the Aztecs, Mayans and whoever knew to our milk bar, chocolate bar. So, 1800s thereabouts, some guy invented the cocoa press. And when you compress your cocoa liquor, you expel cocoa butter. Marvellous stuff. It's the thing in the chocolate that melts at body heat. And so we had the powder made from the compressed cocoa, the butter, and this was a, one of the vital steps in order to make chocolate. The invention of powdered milk by Nestlé in Switzerland, that generated another vital ingredient. And so, with, milk, with powdered milk and chocolate, we could make milk chocolate. First time it appeared in the you know, mid-18th century. Then there was the, the idea of hitching steam to the machines, uh, a machine called a conch, which beats and froths up the chocolate as it's being made. And then, in the 19th century, an English chap by the name of Fry made the first milk bar, milk, chocolate milk bar. And from there it's, as we know it, probably considerably better but in taste, but uh, there it is, that's our product. Now, <coughs> that's the history, how you make a bunch of beans into something really fantastic. Now, cocoa trees, Theobroma cacao, grow about 20, cent uh, 20 centimetres, no, 20 degrees either side of the um, equator. That's their ideal area, it's tropical, and they exist as a tree, understory tree in a tropical forest. So you can't go out and plant you know, endless acres of um, cocoa orchards, it won't work. You have to have trees to shade them, they have to have the right moisture content, they have enough, to, enough water, those sort of things. Um, interesting tree, difficult to grow, subject to an awful lot of diseases. And they have some fabulous names for them, uh, like you know, witch's broom, capsid, Swollen shoot or black pod rot. They sound like curses from a medieval wizard or something, you know. May your shoots swell or something. Anyway, um, that's your tree. The flavour of your chocolate will vary from where the beans that make the chocolate are produced. And I'll say it's unfortunate that I was couldn't get the samples I wanted. I would have uh, liked for you to try, try, try some chocolate from Ecuador and some from Madagascar. There's a French maker who makes chocolates from these areas, single estate chocolates, and same guy, same chocolate content, different flavours. Very, very different, very, very interesting. It's um, worth chasing up some of these things just to see how the terroir or where the chocolate's grown affects it. Um, as far as chocolate's concerned, there are three different 
or three basic types of chocolate. There's um, Criollo beans, Forastero beans, and Trinitaro beans. Now, the Criollo is the original chocolate. It's what's known in chocolate making circles as a flavour bean. It carries an awful lot of flavour. It's very distinctive and really, really interesting to work with. The Forastero bean is a bulk bean, produ produces chocolate flavour, but none of the intensity of the um, Criollo. The unfortunate thing is that when chocolate production was picking up in the um, Caribbean and places like that, there was a lot of problems with, um, well, those diseases I talked about before, viral things, and a lot of work went into finding beans that would keep producing, and so the Forastero was found, um, cultivated, and it forms a major part of a lot of um, mass-produced chocolates. The, you say 90-odd you know, percent of Forastero and say 5 percent, 10 percent of something else for flavour. A bit sad, but uh, there it is. And the Trinitaro bean that I mentioned is a um, hybrid of the other two. Now, if I press the right button, you'll see some cocoa pods. Yes. Now, they're extraordinarily beautiful things, actually, and lots of colours, uh, shapes, sizes. Essentially, they are the fruit of the cocoa tree and just an interesting little oddity. Um, the cocoa tree is odd in as much as the flowers and hence the fruit spring directly from the trunk of the tree. It's a thing known as cauliflory. And so when you if you see pictures of cocoa pods on trees, they just hang directly off the trunk, not on the little branches out the end like an apricot or a peach, but um, directly off the tree. Um, so we have cocoa pod. So when you harvest said cocoa pod, you take out your machete and you press the button. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Oh, yeah. oh, well. Anyway, you find that the uh, cocoa pod, ah, that's it, is full of fat stuff, which doesn't look very attractive. That's the, um, the b cocoa beans uh, held in a sort of mucilaginous mass. So that protects the, um, uh, the beans in the pod. Now, evidently, you can brew a fairly interesting uh, liqueur from that stuff. Um, be a good experiment one day, I guess. Um, but that is a problem. That mass is a big problem when you're trying to um, get cocoa beans. So the first thing that happens to cocoa beans is that they are put in piles and fermented. And I'll just hand these around for people to have a smell. These are just raw um, cocoa beans. They've um, just been fermented and dried, and then that's how they arrive in, in Australia. Pass them along and have a look. Have a smell. smell. Can be that big or that big? Just depends. So can I just ask a question? These beans, yeah. they, is that how they arrive at Hague's? Yes. On Green Hill Road, they just come in the big, the big bag like this. Yeah, yeah, big hessian bag weighing about big, either sixty-seven or sixty-three kilos. Okay. Yeah. So they smell quite sort of. I don't know. Do you like the smell? You do? Yeah, I don't. I, I don't like it. No, I, I know it's funny, isn't it? Yeah. It's a weird smell. It's funny because it's just a, as a, a byproduct of the fermentation process, and uh, there are a lot of um, lactic acid and um, vinegar producing. Uh, bugs in there, and so what happens is after uh, up to 12 days, all that liquid disappears, all that muck <coughs> disappears, and you're left with beans like that, smelling like that, which are then either exported to a chocolate manufacturer or uh, processed to make cocoa butter or um, cocoa liquor. Oh, okay. So we have the beans, so uh, somebody else could um, do the roasting and grinding, or as at Hague's, we do it here ourselves. Now, the fermentation is the first step in the production of the cocoa flavour. As you can smell there, and if you're game enough to taste one, I wouldn't recommend it, um, there's not, nothing very chocolatey there. However, the heat generated by that initial ferment um, kills off a lot of the enzymes and starts the development of the flavour in the chocolate. So these dried beans arrive, say, at Hague's, and first thing we need to do after we've cleaned them up is to 
roast them. And we roast the beans, similar to roasting coffee, same sort of machines. And the beans are roasted. This develops the next part of the flavour. So this um, brings some of the other um, flavour elements in, changes others. We've had a man taste some. Is that right? Yes, I've seen you. See, there you are. What does it taste like? Don't ask for a glass of water now. We told you not to taste them. <laughs> really hungry Australian without the scratching thing. It doesn't have the body yet, but it's got the oh, um, astringency that you find in uh, quite bitter chocolate. Um, but it's not very bitter. It's a little bit tart. and uh, It's not the worst thing I've ever tried. <laughs> we won't, won't ask there. what that was, actually. <laughs> it's a family show. Uh, can, I, can I ask, is there a huge variance in the taste between these beans and between the region? I mean, obviously you've got what Venezuela, you've got Ecuador, what's yeah. one of the others? Are, are there massive differences? Not huge, but I am getting better at telling the difference between the raw beans. Yeah. Okay. If I happen to like them, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but um, there are minor differences. It's more, more pronounced in the... Um, actual chocolate itself. And like mm. any other product, can you get like bad batches of beans? Absolutely, yes. Um, in fact, um, one of the common problems you find with chocolate is, um, and funny enough, from New Guinea, they don't have very many dry days up there in some places where they grow the chocolate. And so they have to dry the beans after the initial fermentation over fires and that will give a smoky flavour to the chocolate. Okay. So if you go down to the second one from the bottom, there should be a little dark pastille, and I apologise for a little bloom on there, but that's nothing to worry about. Now, if you taste that, you'll find, well, you tell me what you find. Everyone, I'm missing out here. I know, do you need chocolate too? No, you don't, you don't like chocolate, do you? Can I have one? Thank you. I, I'm desperate for some chocolate. I don't care if it's in a raw form. Thank you. <laughs> so which one? The second one? No, from the bottom. Oh, yeah. oh that one? Yeah. Where's yeah. that from? New Guinea. Oh. Never had New Guinea in chocolate before. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so what was your... Did anybody taste anything odd or interesting there? Huh? No, it's right. Yeah, one. it's... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what I was wanting you to find was the smokiness there, something you don't or shouldn't find in good quality chocolate. Um, common fault and um, over-roasted beans quite often will uh, yield a um, bacony sort of flavour to your chocolate. Yeah. It's a known fault, it's something um, you just don't get to see that often. Um, so mm. after roasting, poor old beans on their way to the chocolate bar, they're uh, put mm. through a mill, two sort of plates grinding them together, <laughs> high heat and pressure. And given that your um, cocoa bean is about 50 odd, 54 odd percent fat, heat and pressure gives you a nice liquid mass. And well, I'll go back a bit. Why not taste some of the nibs in the top um, uh, cup, yes. Now they're just broken roasted cocoa bean. Again, you've noticed the flavour has come up quite a lot and you can sort of detect the fattiness as you chew them. There's a sort of smoothness. Mm. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, because they've been roasted. They're, they're hard, yeah. Do you know, they're not that bad. Yeah, I, I quite like them. Oh, it's quite nice. I could eat a bowl of this. Well, there's a local chocolatier making um, <laughs> dark chocolate with this sprinkled in it. It's very nice. Very well. There's a pretty well known recipe for our um, venison and uh, chocolate uh, ragu. Yeah. Yes. That works well as a savoury, yes. So, yeah, that's your raw bean. After um, milling, you, if you. Sorry. Yeah. No. <laughs> like it and I'd justify it by saying it's not really chocolate it's some sort of nut like a muesli almost <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. now that's 
a bit bitter, whatever. If you taste what's in the second cup, mm. the liquor, this is just um, what you would purchase from uh, a refinery. They'd, nice. They would have the beans come in, they'd grind them and just uh, sell the stuff. Yeah, and that's the liquor. So it's, if you like, it's 100% chocolate. So there's oh. no sugar, there's no anything else in it at all. It's um, quite oh. a lot more bitter than the just the nib. And yeah. it's purely because it's been, it's been ground a lot and all the um, flavour components have been released. Oh, nice. um, yeah. So, not a very edible product at that stage. <laughs> Doesn't look much. It's black, it's dull, <laughs> uh, it's a bit gritty. Um, and so, chocolate then, or the liquor, goes through a refining machine. It's usually five large rollers stacked one on top of the other and they roll in such a way that the paste of the milk powder, the cocoa butter, cocoa, go into the bottom of the rollers and just get wound through the rollers and come out of the top. Um, the idea of that is to reduce the particle size of your chocolate so that it's below roughly 20 microns, which is the thought to be the limit of human perception, so that um, the chocolate is smooth on the tongue, doesn't feel gritty. Um, you can get some American chocolates that are noticeably gritty. Um, I personally find it quite unpleasant. <laughs> uh, I like a smooth chocolate, but yeah. it is how it works. So that refining, again, this just changes the texture. One of your um, five senses, this is the pr um, method of tailoring it. Then the, what would be called chocolate crumb, goes into a conch. And this machine stirs it and uh, heats it over time. Now this is a, a really, really important step because as you can imagine, there are still some of those lactic uh, vinegary tastes still in there. You can have a fair amount of acid. And um, this heating, kneading process drives all those volatiles off and gets rid of all your unwanted flavours. So at this stage, We've made it smooth. We've um, made the flavour right. Um, one of the last operations done, and it's something I found quite magical to watch, is when you've been conching the thing all night, it's kneaded all this paste and it's hot, it's about 60 odd degrees C or something, and it's like putty. It's very thick, very heavy. And you add however many kilos of lecithin that you need, and before your eyes, like this small amount of liquid turns the whole thing into a three tonnes of liquid chocolate. It's oh. fantastic. <laughs> oh my God. Um, yeah, it's, it's really cool. Have you ever just wanted to take off all of your clothes? Come on, you can tell us, and just dive in. No. <laughs> but I have had chocolate in my ear and it's very hard to get out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that, that's the end of your chocolate. But having done all those things, we've got something that is, feels good in the mouth, tastes good, smells good. We now want it to look and sound good. And that's the last part of the um, chocolate mystery. Um, what you would call the um, tempering of chocolate. And cocoa butter is the beastie that we're working with. It's found not only in the cocoa liquor, the mashed up beans, but also in the cocoa butter that we add. And cocoa butter is not a single fat, and so it doesn't set at a particular temperature. And this is why tempering chocolate is a problem for some folk. It can set in, I think, five different ways. One we want, the others will lead a dreadful um, product. The um, thing we're looking for is a good snap when you um, break it and a nice shiny um, looking product. Uh, if you heat chocolate the, like the Papua New Guinea one that you had, if you um, looked at that you find it was a little grey on the outside. It's been kept somewhere where it's a bit warm and some of the cocoa butter's migrated to the surface mm. and it's um, crystallised in a different shape or form. Um, if you ever are unfortunate enough to leave something you really like in the sun for too long and it goes liquid and you try and reclaim it, don't. 
you need to you need to retemper it, and it's a bit messy. But there we are. That's the um, who got it first, and what you do to make a smelly bean into something really delectable. Thank you. <laughs> hang on, hang on, hang on. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, who's noticed that there's one left? There's one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So what are we about to eat now? I say it's got the beautiful Hague name on it. Is yeah. this one of your premium products? Is this? It certainly is, but it's for saving, because. Oh no way! Yes. Because. <laughs> Who's eating it? Robert. Robin. You have. I knew there's always one. <laughs> Robin will explain what this is all about. Okay, so we have we can't touch it. Not just don't yet. touch it. Okay, thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic, Brendan Somerville. <laughs>